Oh, uh, hello world. Welcome to Comic Book News. I'm your old pal, Dan Shaheen. Maybe I should have said bonjour. I don't know what I should have said. Uh, because we're in France, but not France of today, but France of the not too distant future. We're going to be talking with a guy called Mike Kennedy. Mike Kennedy runs an operation called Magnetic Press, which is an imprint of Lion Forge Comics. This is uh, Lion Forge is a really interesting operation. I want to talk with Mike a little bit about I want to talk to them about Magnetic Press and their, I don't want to just call them European flavor, or I want to call them international flavored comics, right? That's what that little passport image here was all about. Your, your passport to a world of wonder. You'll be able to see uh, the world of wonder at the, what, the Comic-Con virtual Comic-Con that's going on? Start tomorrow. We're going to talk to him about that too. We're going to talk to him about his career before comics, how he got into comics, what's up with uh, all of these really excellent comics that honestly I'd never read before. Um, before uh, uh, I, I got reached out to by Magnetic, said, hey, Dan, take a look at some of these books. And I was like, yeah, okay. I expected, you know, some rinky dink operation with a couple whatever, because honestly, I'm, they were not on my radar. And I'm looking at these things and I'm going, wow, there's some really, there's not a stinker among the stuff that they sent me to look at. And, and there's some real gems in there. We'll talk about, we can't talk about all of them because there's so many, but we'll talk about the key few. It broke it up into a couple sections. Uh, Mike has talked about their, their daytime programming and their primetime programming. So we'll talk about how that works, how they're putting out books literally for all the age ranges, not just concentrating on young adults or preteen or adults or any of that. They're, they're going for everybody as, uh, you know, as any smart publisher in this day and age would be doing. So what? Oh, chat. Guys, I see comments in the comments already. And that's great. Love the comments. We love them. You can even super chat. You can sprinkle money on me if you want. And I'll take that money. I'll spend it on comic books and I'll read them. Okay, but what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to interrupt my conversation with Mike. In fact, I'm going to be trying really hard to not look at those comments at all. Mike can't even see him. I, I, I look at him once in a while, uh, but I try to concentrate on the conversation we're going to have. But never fear. At the end of this thing, we'll have uh, the viewer Q&A section. We'll bring up all. We'll look at all the comments, especially those super chats. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll grill Kennedy and make sure he answers all those tough questions that you fans out there have. 
Okay, what else? Um, yeah, that's it. Let's talk to Mike. I I've jabbered on enough. Let's bring in Mike Kennedy from Magnetic Press. Mike, welcome hey. to Comic Book News. Hey, thanks. It's cool. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, you sound great. Okay, good. Little tiny, maybe a tiny bit of audio lag, so I apologize. I'll try not to um, try okay. not to step on you. Um, so welcome. Uh, Mike, I'm looking at these comics. I'm looking at Magnetic Press's comics, and I'm super impressed. There's a lot of stuff I want to talk to you, but before we can get to those, let's talk a little bit about you, Mike Kennedy, and where you came from. So um, oh, I, I read your bio. It's in the it's in the description in this video right now if people want to look at it. Well, why don't you give us just kind of the, uh, the Cliff Notes version of that and tell us uh, where you came from, how you came into comics. Uh, well, let's see. I started my career out of college in video games actually as an animator and a, and an artist believe it or not and um at the same time i was also starting to write comics for dark horse so i did a little bit of stuff with dark horse while i was also working video games kind of straddling the fence and keeping a foot in both lanes and uh yeah after about 20 years of doing both with the video games being the full-time career i uh had this opportunity to join archaea as their publisher and um that was it. That was the big field. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mike. You cut out for a second there. You mentioned Archaea, who who produced yeah. some some really fantastic comics. I remember when I had my comic book store, uh, Mouse Guard was hitting the scene and it really took the market by storm. Um, uh, how did you get involved with Archaea, and what did you do specifically with them? Uh, well, so I wrote a I wrote a storyline for a video game called um, Crimecraft. It was an online shooter, kind of a gangsters in the future, kind of Blade Runner gang warfare type of thing. So I wrote the storyline for that video game campaign, and we were going to tell all of our cutscenes with comic book panels and stuff. So we got we got so actually we got some pretty big names. We got Howard Chaykin, we got uh, Glenn Fabry, we got Zach Howard. Uh, ben Temple Smith, um, Trevor Hairstein. I mean, we got a bunch of really great oh. artists. We got like 12 great artists to do this anthology comic for the video game. And at the end of the game, we were like, we've got all this great material. Let's publish this. And I didn't know anything about publishing. Archaea, who happened to be here in Chicago at the time, they were like, yeah, that looks good. We'll publish that. And so that kind of opened up the conversation between me and them. And in the course of just a few months, they were like, you know, we like the way your brain works. Why don't you uh, come work for us? We're moving to L.A. We're going to set up a studio, see, and it's going to be awesome. And uh, I'm like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take that trick. OK, so yeah. you, you you packed up the truck and you, you moved to Beverly moved or to what? Beverly, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I gave up video games, which, yeah, I mean, it was a big shift. But the thing is, is video games are such a. It was such a rat race where you've got literally like 15 producers. I mean, the entire credits is like 500 names or more. And it's like, you're just one tiny piece of that huge project. Whereas in comics, I was like, yeah, I can be one of five. I would much rather be one of five making something yeah. cool. So, yeah. Or frankly, in this day and age, even one, right? It's like... Yeah. I, video games is one of those things where it really is almost the antithesis of what you can do with comics. I mean, there are solo video game guys that can make my fun, fun and interesting games for sure. But yeah, but you, but you can have one singular cartoonist that can create stuff at the highest level, right. Of comics right. where one programmer or one person cannot hope to compete with the multi-million dollar budgets or, or whatever in video. Games. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you'll have like Mike Mignola will crank out, you know, a series of you know 32 page masterpieces you know all on his own and then you know we're trying to trying to get that same kind of emotional impact out of you know a six million dollar video game that's going to cost another okay. four million to market and it's like boy yeah and it's a grind it's a huge risk you work years and years on a single project that may or may uh -oh. not be successful and then yep. they break up the band and then the whole cycle starts all over again Right. Yeah, I mean, I worked on so many projects. I, I bet you in my career, I've worked on more projects that never saw the light of day than actually published book or published games. Yeah, and and the things, the ones that didn't see the light of day, were always going to be the best ones. Right, those are the hard, the biggest heartbreaks. So they, you know that those are going to be awesome. We were working on a Snake Plissken game. I got to work with Kurt Russell and John Carpenter, right. and that got pulled. It was like, oh, 
Bummer. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you're like, man, this is heartbreaking, but my heart is not getting broken enough. Let me move into comics and let's <laughs> see what comics can do. So, well, they lured me with, it. they lured me with all of the, uh, the, the creative pipe dreams. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to become a huge writer. I'm going to start writing all these books again and I'm going to start. But then it was like, no, I can't. This, this isn't a vanity position. Like, we're helping other authors get published and this is this is an operation you know and so I, i'm embarrassed i don't know this but what is your official title is it publisher yeah 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 uh, and but you are oh, so let's talk a little bit about what magnetic is and was right so talk, tell me about that and how you came to have a relationship with lion forge well yeah so so uh while well, working with Arkea as publisher of Arkea, you know, we got, I was with them for about three years and it was kind of their last three years before they got bought up by Boom. And so, you know, we were doing better and better and starting to get those Eisner Awards, which was really, really great. And I think that uh, that's one of the reasons why Boom was so interested in acquiring Arkea. Uh, thing is, they already had a publisher of their own, so they didn't need two. So, I mean, it was all amicable, but I mean, it was pretty clear that, yeah, the, the writing's kind of on the wall. I should probably just consider what I want to do moving forward. And uh, I decided to just start a new publishing company on my own, Magnetic. So I uh, took out a bank loan and I uh, partnered up with a friend who helped me get all of the legal uh, stuff together and the corporate ID stuff together. And um, yeah, within the first six months, we had our first book on the shelf. Okay. So... That's a big totally leap of faith. Isn't that a big leap yeah. of faith? I mean, yeah. what, so what's the, what's the, what's the mission statement, Mike? What's the, like when you went, when you found it magnetic, what was the, is it, was it international comics as a focus, as a preference? And and if so, why, where, where does that interest come from? Yeah. I, I don't think it was any kind of like a mission statement or anything, but there were a bunch of foreign titles. So I was kind of introduced to all of these cool French and Spanish and Italian books working for Arkea because they did a bunch of uh, French books. Um, oh, no, I'm totally blanking on a bunch of them, but they did a bunch of French books and got me over to Angoulême once or twice to attend that festival on behalf of their library. And yeah. it was just eye opening. Suddenly there were all these books and it was just, it was just, amazing stuff so i already had a short laundry list of titles that i wanted to bring into archaea that for one reason or another hadn't happened at that point so as soon as the decision came to start something new i already i had my targets i had i had my first seven books already lined up okay so what was the top, top of that list uh well there was doom boy naja zaya mecca <laughs> all written by the same guy and they're not related in any way um lumine basically i was really targeting bengal he he was an artist that i really enjoyed his stuff he did uh naja and mecca and lumine um and he i don't think anybody in the states really heard of him yet but we put out his first I, I, i'll admit I'm, I, I'm 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 Sad to say, I'm not aware of that. That's not a name I'm familiar with. I'm not familiar well, with Well, so name. the thing is, after the first, we released his first three books in that first year, and then all of a sudden he was working for DC. Like, they were like, hey, you want to draw Supergirl? And so he was drawing Supergirl. And then, then Marvel had him drawing, was it Spider-Gwen? And, like, the next uh, thing you knew, he was, oh, and then he was doing Batgirl. So it's like suddenly I couldn't get him on the phone anymore. <laughs> it's like he just took off. And now he's working with Rick Remender on uh, Hope or Glory, what is it, Death or Glory? and. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's like, it's, that was, that's, if there was a mission statement for Magnetic, it was finding a way to get these guys the recognition they deserve in the States. Like Tony Sandoval, yeah. who did um, Doom Boy. I just always loved his stuff. And, you know, nobody in the States, I mean, you know, the fanatics had heard about him, but, you know, most people hadn't. It's the first release here got him a Eisner nomination. Yeah. And I think we've done, what, four of his books so far? With another one hopefully next year so yeah it's just giving these given these really really awesome deserving artists another stage here in the states and hopefully another audience what i love about it is you know i love seeing new talent new things new cartoonists i've never seen before right but when it's an American cartoonist and it's somebody new it's usually somebody breaking in right so it's their early stuff and and they're cutting their teeth and whatever. And that's great. I love to read those too. But when you bring in some of these people who have been working over in Europe and producing yeah. it with the high production values over there in Europe, 
that we're just catching up to now. It's like this fully formed talents drop in. And, and I feel like now they've worked for the mainstream companies, American comics readers, their sensibilities are primed for this kind of uh, this yeah. style of artwork. Yeah, I think so. And the thing is, is on a business model, it really made sense for us to start off with that because we're getting, you know, triple A level material for just a license fee. It's like we're not having to pay the page rate for them to create it from scratch. So, I mean, it made a lot of sense for us to do that. Plus, if it takes off, that artist most likely has a whole back catalog that we can follow up with. Yeah, it's a, it's a really amazing opportunity, and and but you know also risk. You said these this guy now uh, some of the people that maybe you broke here in the states you, they you, they won't return your phone calls or too busy drawing Supergirl or whatever, right? So how yeah. do you uh, how can you compete with that when you when you drop these guys fully formed great talents into the market, and and there's people working for all the major publishers that are looking for just that sort of thing, yeah. and they want to snatch them out from Magnetic. What do you offer to those folks? Besides Mike being a swell guy, that uh, that that keeps him in the fold, or is that a challenge? Or well, it kind of is. I mean, uh, you know, magnetic small to the point where you know we certainly can't offer any kind of high page rates for original material, and you know our licenses are based on. I mean, it's a simple formula for what a, a licensed royalty will and can pay out based on how many books you sell. So, you know, there's only so much we can do at our size as we grow, then that scope becomes bigger and we can maybe attract more flies or butterflies. Um, but I, I just like to stay in touch and stay friends with these guys. Like for example, Bengal, granted he's been working with Rick Remender and doing his image stuff for the last three years, but he's going to do a piece for our, Paris art book. So, you know, we're still in touch and, you know, we still, we still try to do what we can together when we can. Okay. So, yeah. Great. Well, okay. So tell us a little bit in that then about Lion Forge and how that came about. Yeah. So, okay. So magnetic ran for about three years, just to, again, totally independent. It was just me and my wife working out of the house. I was doing, you know, all of the web store packaging, like everything. Um, and in those first three years, I think we had gotten 10 Eisner nominations. So we were doing really good. Like each, our first three years of eligibility, we had nominees all three years. And I think that caught the attention of Lion Forge, who at the time they were looking at kind of revamping and doing like a Lion Forge 2.0. And that was where they, you know, they hired a bunch of um, experienced editors and starting to put together their, their superhero line. And, you know, they're making a lot of bold decisions, but in an effort to grow. And so they looked at Magnetic as an opportunity to kind of grow into a little more of that, I don't know, kind of hardcover graphic literature side, you know, a little bit of that um, graphic novel. I hope full here just at, at Lion Forge, because I was pretty impressed. I hadn't been paying much attention to him, to be honest. And, and, mm -hmm. They really do seem to be trying to serve all set anybody who might read comics like they're looking for the direct market, but that's like one time one part of what who they're targeting, it seems like. Yeah, well, so that was the thing is when they brought Magnetic on board, Magnetic was not an imprint, it was a collection because their imprints were very clearly delineated by age group. Like you see they they had yeah. Cub House for kids, Roar for Teens, Caracal was middle grade. And then Quillian was their game stuff. But Magnetic technically wasn't an imprint. It was a collection because Magnetic was re releasing books inside each of those. Like I had kids books in Caracal. I had teen books in Roar. Um, so it did get a little bit confusing with, you know, I all see. these, you know, imprints and kind of. Because you're, you know, you're on the confetti of logos. Yeah, you know. the stuff from Magnetic, you're saying cut across all kind of all across these different segments as well. Yeah. At the time, I think when they brought Magnetic on board, the thought was that Magnetic will be kind of a, I don't know, maybe kind of like a quality thumbprint on the specific titles. Kind of like, in fact, that's kind of why they decided to call it the Magnetic Collection to kind of harken to like the Criterion Collection. So by just having the magnetic mark, it was kind of like a gold star that put that book a little bit. See, I don't want to say above, because I mean, they had a lot of really good books that weren't magnetic, but it just kind of helped identify those books within the brand. You can but say even, above, like, you can say it, that's all right, let it out. Your, your books are better than the than the average book. And that's okay to say. 
Uh, it's okay to feel that way. <laughs> well, so the thing is, is it just got to be so confusing that honestly, the magnetic brand started to lose uh -huh. its value and awareness. I mean, the, the fact that magnetic as a brand has been around for over six years now, but Lisa and I are now having to try to kind of reestablish it and reintroduce it because there are a lot of people, a lot of retailers, a lot of fans who they think we're brand new. They've never heard of magnetic. And I think yeah. part of that, part of that has to do with those three years with lion forge not that they were bad years because we were all doing exciting things but in terms of the brand identity magnetic really did start to fade into the background okay makes so sense when, you know? yeah, yeah a lot going on over there at lion forge right and so you felt uh uh i'm uh, sorry a lot going on there at, at lion forge ancillary like around lion a uh, magnetic and you felt it was time to refocus back on the magnetic what it meant to be a magnetic comet well, I had been thinking about that the whole time, <laughs> but the cool right. thing is, is Polarity, the upper board at Polarity Limited, they're the holding company that holds all of those Lion Forge, Oni Magnetic. They started to think of that completely on their own. And so that was, that was the really encouraging thing is ah. when the, when the Oni merger came up, they're like, all right, well, let's move, let's, let's squeeze our two comic book companies together for optimization. But they proactively looked at that and said, yeah, but you know, Magnetic, that's, that's its own little thing. It's its own, it's its own gem. Let's pull it out of the cake batter and wash it off and put it on the side of the sink and, and let it shine on its own. So that's what we're doing. So Magnetic, after the Oni merger, as I think officially it was October 1st last year, and our first official release was January of this year, we are an independent company all over again. Congratulations. Still owned by Polarity, and, but independently operated. Uh, congratulations. That's great. And and what I just see is just such a breadth of material. It's such a crazy. breath of fresh air to see. Uh-oh. We might be having some connection problems. Well, what I'm trying to say here is uh, I'm going to yank him for a second. Yeah, till he connects. It's, uh, man, the, the, the breadth of material coming out from... Uh, here comes Mike again from uh, magnetic is really impressive. There's stuff that looks so appealing to all the demographics and like, Hey Mike, welcome back. I, I almost feel like the underserved demographic in comics these days has ironically become like the juvenile teen market because like we got for a while, that's what comics all they were considered. Then they got too adult for that. Now we've gotten into these, all ages, really young comics, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then there's not a full spectrum of comics reads. Somebody could cut, could be born and start reading magnetic comics and grow up as an adult and just, you know, really graduate into everything that you guys have to offer here. It's kind of, you, know, you know, we kind of, kind of, we do kind of want to do something like that. I mean, we've kind of thought about ourselves. We're trying to like think of ourselves in terms of more like a, uh, like a network brands like you know hbo they've got you know sure they've got game of thrones but they've also got sesame street you know and so they build a family of titles that everybody can enjoy and so in the household hbo is a respected brand because everybody's got their pieces of it and we're kind of thinking we can do something like that right and if you watch uh hbo in the daytime there's going to be Sesame Street and there's going mm -hmm. to be middle age. And then if you wait till, till the evening hours, till prime time, then you're going to get your Bill Maher and you're going to get your adults type material, right? Yep. Your attack uh, cab confessions and what, and what, and whatnot, whatever right. else they do. Yeah. Um, so similarly, you, you, we talked a little bit about how you've got sort of your daytime and your nighttime uh, or your prime timeline. Yeah. Um, so talk about, to me about that concept a little bit. Yeah, we're trying we're, we're 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 trying to avoid the whole trap of imprints because you know we're still so young. We're just trying to establish our own brand and our own logo. So without without even running the risk of introducing new imprint logos and IDs, we're just describing our stuff in terms of you can easily cut our library kind of down the middle. And it's kind of like daytime programming, which is you got stuff from kids up to middle grade and even into the teens and YA stuff. And then you've got stuff that just feels like primetime programming. You know, it's just a little bit more, a little more sophisticated. It's a little more, 
nah, maybe not hardcore, but a little bit more, I don't know, just more mature, you know, that I think 16, 17 and up can enjoy. So between well, yeah. daytime, I, I was oh, so say between, between daytime and, and prime time, it's kind of like, which side of 17 do you fall? You know, are you looking for something light that's not going to uh, risk offending or are you, you open to that kind of challenge? Right. Well, I want to say, because this stuff, well, this is an all ages book or this is in your all ages section here. Mm -hmm. And this is um, sophisticated cartooning. This is, is really beautiful looking stuff. Yep. I, I, and so, so sophisticated, yes, but still aimed at that, not necessarily aimed at uh, uh, a, a, an older audience. And I love that combo. Right. Yeah. This I love this book. This particular book, A Sea of Love. It actually got three Eisner nominations last year. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's like if you loved that, what was that film, Triplets of Belleville, where there's oh, like yeah. there's no dialogue at all, but it's just these quirky characters, and it's a it's kind of a real life story. You know, it's a it's not a weird fantasy but it's just a quirky human story it's got that same appeal yeah okay i'm just gonna i'm just kind of browsing through your catalog a little bit and i'm gonna pull up a couple of, uh, of of high water spots that i happen to look at um i i really the one that <laughs> that that um stuck out me the most is gunland we'll talk about that in a minute right um because i looked it's just so visually appealing and interesting and the one that sort of was not on my radar as much was Mr. In Invincible. And mm -hmm. and both you and um, uh, uh, super PR person Lisa. to the star, Lisa, uh, says so like, Dan, you got to take a look at this because this is not what you think. And it's yeah. innovative. It's interesting. Tell me a little bit about um, Mr. Invincible. Yeah. I mean, we've got it in our middle grade group, but I mean, it's just super fun. It kind of, it's, it it's, kind of got a little bit of that little Nemo feel to it where it's, you know, these paneled squares, but there's just something magical going on with them. And in this particular case, he's the first real comic book superhero because he can break the fourth wall. He can hop between panels. He can throw things between panels. He sees what's going on and panels behind him and in front of him. And the entire book just breaks apart all of the mechanical physics Yes. Of sequential art. Like there's yeah. one there's one short story where a villain, his superpower is being able to phase through pages. So he'll like disappear in one panel, but when you turn the page, he's reappearing at that same spot on the page and the story continues. And it's just so incredibly creative the way it just plays with your sense of time and space. And I think I think it it is it does kind of raise the bar for like following a story non-linearly and on yes. many layers but i think kids will dig that i mean i think i remember as a kid just all those little rube goldberg you know yeah like things like just you want to see how things work and you want to see if you're following the the thread and i think kids will love this well comics can be challenging to read for people anyway not for kids so much who just sort of take to it naturally when it's good cartooning but this almost takes it to the next level of it's it's almost like a puzzle yeah. to read one of these comics, um, but it's beautifully cartooned and yeah. and subtle and well written and just fun to read and and um, nothing overwhelming or ultra yeah uh, overwhelming in any way, but just fun. Yeah, well, I mean, there that that example at the bottom uh, there with the the guy picking up the trees. I mean, it even kind of there's something slightly educational about like learning perspective because his whole superpower is he can reach ah. into the depth as if the world is in two dimensions, but yeah. in reality, you know, he's destroying a tree. So well, yeah. I like it. It breaks all the rules of comics, but as a to show that how you can break all of those rules in a in an interesting and fun way. This is going to make kids think about what you can and can't do or should and shouldn't do. And why shouldn't I, or why right. couldn't I? And I loved it. I love this. is My favorite magnetic comic for sure. I think in, I, in the world of comics rules are made to be broken. Oh yeah. And this guy's doing it. All right. We loved it. So we'll come. I, I could talk about this one, honestly, all night. It's my, it's, it's really is my favorite, but let's look a little bit. Let's go on to, um, I want to talk about Gunland. This is this. I just had some real, it's really, this one's really visually appealing to me. Yeah. Of course, it's got crazy colorful dinosaurs and, and, and old West science fiction 
on acid kind of theme <laughs> going on. Tell me about yeah. Dunlap. Where's this come from? So this is from an Italian artist named his his his, uh, his pen name is Captain Artiglio, um, but he's you know he's very much he he started off as mostly a web comic artist and he just built a huge fan base in that. So this is his first long form, and this is actually the first volume. It's a trilogy. So the second volume will be coming out in November, and then the third one next spring. But it's just yeah, like you said, it's bonkers. I mean, it's dinosaur, it's cyborg mercenaries and the cowboys all ride dinosaurs. And there's like these ancient vampire skulls that will give you superpowers, but those powers could, you know, turn out to like wreak havoc and destroy the universe. And there's like, oh uh, yeah, there's just so much crazy stuff going I on. Didn't, was this trail, did you just draw, finish this trailer now? Because I don't think it was there before I was looking for it before. Uh, yeah, actually, we just debuted that last week. Yep. Can I play it right now? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Oh man, and with the spaghetti western yeah. style music there, uh, Enrico Morricone, rest in peace, yeah. just last week, by the way. Um, yeah, it, it seemed kind of fitting, you know, this being, you know, it's an Italian artist, it was originally published in Italian, it just feels like, yeah, you gotta have that Italian spaghetti western flavor to it. But yeah. Oh man, but, but it's really nutty. I really love the look of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm really, I'm, ex I'm excited about that. I mean, it just came out last week in comic shops, so I mean, we're still trying to, we're still trying to like break through that whole three month quarantine pandemic market storm. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, this, that's one of the books that I think just it, it needs to get, it, it needs to catch despite that so we're hoping with the second and third volumes that people the audience will just continue to build well let's talk about that actually just for a second because here's where i what i was wondering about this is i'm just super curious about um let me i'm going to stop sharing here for a second but the book i title like gunland the name the word gun is right in there it's super oh. violent there's guys getting shot in the head on page two okay the original volume the original title in Italian. I mean, actually, it was an it was an English title, but in Italy, the title was "Kids with Guns." <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Ah, that might be a little bit of a challenge." I, I almost like that life. better, though. I almost, but but okay. So you see, what would be the challenge with a title like that? Yeah, certainly here in America, is it different in Italy where there's? I'm assuming that there is greater gun control i don't know that i'm just assuming that and that there's not a school violence problem or whatever so that wouldn't be considered a touchy topic i just wonder if you've gotten any pushback here in the states on gun comics for kids not really no i mean we it was it was a concern at the first in, in the first place which is why we decided to adjust the name and we got the, and the author was totally cool with it he totally understood um, in fact, the original publisher, when he sent it to us, he's like, hey, I think you should really look at this. This is really cool. You may need to change the title, but, and so he was right. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know completely what the, uh, what the attitude of gun culture is. I mean, I know throughout Europe, they see America as just gun crazy, uh, yeah. cowboys. So, I mean, yeah, I know right. that it is a lot more controlled over there, but, and I think that's probably why the Westerns were so popular in the first place 
But this book, even though it is kind of for kids, it's still in that YA spectrum. There's some swears in it. There's quite a few swears. Oh, there's F bombs um, dropping. Yeah, yeah, right in there. Which I was a little bit surprised at too, con considering the, the, not not in a bad way, but right. just like n wasn't something I was expecting. Yeah, I mean, this is we 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 definitely put that towards the YA spectrum. I mean, it's it's we would put it up there with like your Rick and Morty's or your you know Adult Swim cartoons. Ah, uh, okay. It, it okay. definitely looks like a cartoon, but it's a primetime cartoon. I could see it as an Adult Swim type cartoon for sure. Um, okay, so let's talk now. Let's move into the later evening. It's a sophisticated. Perhaps we have a snifter of cognac or maybe Italian wine, a Prosecco or so. I don't know. I don't drink, so I don't really know. <laughs> um, but let's talk about Sergio. Is it Topi or Toppy? Uh, I always pronounce it Topi. Okay. But now I'm not sure. I think it's Topi. Because now here's again a name that I should be familiar with because I'm looking at this stuff and it's clearly he's a master. And then as I go through it and I'm reading some of this stuff and I go, oh, so here's where Bill Sienkiewicz and Frank Miller and so many others drew a, just a humongous amounts of inspiration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've gotten, I mean, we, so I, I as you were scrolling through there. So the first volume, Bill Sienkiewicz. Yeah, I have the whole volume right here. I want to, okay. I want to, I want to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. The second like volume, you? David Mack wrote the forward. The third volume, we had Dave McKean write the forward. Uh, we got John Jennings wrote the uh, one for four coming up. We've got Kent Williams on board. We've got Baron Story supposed to write a forward. So, I mean, this guy is, he influenced so many people. I mean, Sean Gordon Murphy and, I mean, Walt Simonson, it's just... I mean, how many Vertigo comic covers am I seeing here, like, got <laughs> ripped off from this guy alone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he was doing things with composition and, like, the use of black and white that, I mean, were even fresh compared to, you know, what Will Eisner introduced. I mean, he's... And I'm sorry, what was his era? When was he... When was this stuff... When was he in his prime of his The era? majority of the stuff was in, I would say, the 70s. His his, his real peak uh -huh. to popularity was in the 70s, and he continued working through, you know, the 2000s. He passed away in, I want to say, 2012, 11 or 12. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, by that point, he, and he had, had such a body of work that, I mean, our library collection is right now planned for eight volumes, but I mean, we could easily do twice that number. Right. Which we may, if they, I mean, these have actually been a, a fairly good seller for us. I'd say that the Topi collection has probably been the second best series in our um, library. So if they continue to sell well, we very well may do 20 volumes. Who knows? And is it selling well, let's say, internationally or in America, extremely well in America? Or what's the, like, how, how does that break down? How do your sales in general break down, like, overseas compared to America? Well, right. our, our license is for English in most cases. I mean, granted, it depends on the publisher and the licensor. But in most uh -huh. of our cases, our license is for English language rights worldwide. So in most of the cases, we're publishing them in English for the first time, but then we can sell that English edition throughout the world. So um, Diamond does distribute internationally to, to what extent or success, I guess, is uh, open for debate. But, you know, I've, we've seen our books in comic shops in Tel Aviv and, you know, Poland and India. So... I mean, our books do get around the world. If if somebody wants to read these stories in English, uh, ours is the only edition that they can find. And in yeah, a lot I'm of cases, a lot of cases, a lot of the authors are saying that they like our volumes better than the originals, just because wow. we'll collect them nicely, we'll put them in oversized hardcovers. So we've actually had some authors say they prefer our volume over even their originals. I'm sorry. I'm just getting lost in the beauty of this stuff. And I'm a, sh yeah. I'm a little bit ashamed. Maybe I'm not ashamed of myself. Maybe I'm just ashamed that uh, this stuff has not been widely available in the United States for me to really peruse before, before no, recently. Nothing to be ashamed of. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for people to discover. It's an opportunity for us to put books on the shelves and food on our plates. <laughs> 
Thanks, yeah. Mike. But I'm, a, but I'm a comic book snob, so I need to know these things so I can look down on those who do not know. <laughs> right. But, all right. So I'm working on that. Um, all right. So let's let's talk more. Let's talk about Nils for a second. I want to bring that one up. Yeah. Okay. This is Nils because this is beautiful looking stuff. This was this was was this one of the early or more recent or early releases? Tell me about Nils. So this was actually well, this was the first release of the new magnetic. So this came out in January, but this was our first book that we released as kind of the re the renewed independent magnetic. And I honestly, I think this was the perfect book to release as the return to form because, you know, magnetics first year books and some of our second year books, they were just, you know, 256 pages. They were just, just beautiful. Like, Naja and Zaya and Doom Boy, people were looking at those like, like gallery pieces. And so I think we got a, a little bit away from them. Not that, not that we didn't have beautiful books during those Lion Forge years, but we kind of moved away from these, this just gorgeous painted stuff for a little just bit. Just lush, rich is the word that comes to mind when I see these things. I don't know yeah. how else to describe it. Beautiful yep. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. This artist, Antoine Carrion, he's, He's just phenomenal. And actually, we've got another book of his that we're just about ready to sign the ink on that we'll put out next year. But he's just, it's just amazing. I mean, it's so, it's painterly, but it, but then when you zoom in on the characters and you look at their faces, it's got a little bit of an anime feel, a little, uh -huh. it's got a little Otomo, but yet it's kind of, uh -huh. kind of pastel painted. And yeah, it's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Really great stuff, nice storytelling, and the coloring and the, just the beauty of the pages, you know, they speak for themselves here. It's yeah, really now I know one thing is when people look at this on digital, like when we sent out review PDFs, um, a lot of people say, oh, the letters are so small, but the, what they don't realize is that in the, we printed this at nine by 12, so it's actually a, a fairly large hardcover. Uh -huh. oh, so when you're reading the physical edition, yeah, yeah, yeah the text is perfectly, Oh, that makes sense because you're not really filling the balloons here. It's like you got a little more room here to go, my. You know, yeah. But I guess everything would look really big at, at that oversized printing. Yeah, Sorry. and one one of the challenges that we also find with a lot of these European books is that, and I don't know why this is, but it's kind of par for the course for the artists to draw the balloons in the page. It's not a separate layer. So with, in a lot of these cases. The balloons are what they are, you know. Oh, we can fill them better. Uh, we can fill them better. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. So, well, yeah. frankly, it's such an integral part of the layout and composition and everything else that I would assume, you know, most people who are like cartoonist type cartoonist, not assembly line parts of a team, you know, want would want that level of control. I guess. Yeah, and I think in a lot of cases, the artists themselves. I think they might do their own lettering. Like in a lot of yeah, a lot of the program or projects that we've done, when we get the font package, the InDesign package, it'll be a hand drawn font that they have created out of their own handwriting. So yeah, I mean, I guess the artist takes a lot of personal credit for the lettering and layout. As they should, man. That's great. That's just that's the that's what separates, a, in my view, like a cartoonist from you know a, a, a person involved in the making of comics. I guess. <laughs> An assembly line book, yeah, and that, not that there's anything wrong with those and work for hire and everything else. You yeah. really need it, it's but just there's a different. Just uh, yeah, it's a it's a different it's a it's a different type of crafting. Yeah. It's assembly well, I mean, versus art. I don't know. Well, so tell me, I don't want to go that far, but yeah, I, 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 uh, because there's that there's something to a synthesis of a great team too that you can't take away from, like when you get a. Yeah. You got a Todd Klein doing letters on, you know, on top of like a great artist or whatever. That's magic. Um, but so tell me though about Nils here because I was looking through it and I was like, all right, Nordic, Game of Thrones, whatever. And then suddenly I start seeing uh, uh, other types of Robots. elements. Yeah, I start seeing sci-fi elements. It's I, I, it goes in so many places. I mean, it's it is uh, it is very much a Nordic myth because you know he's going after the Tree of Life. He's being pursued by these three forgotten goddesses i mean it takes place in the future so that's where you kind of get your far future technology yeah. but then it's also got this kind of miyazaki style these you know spirits of nature 
And yeah. basically the storyline is the storyline is this 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 high tech kingdom has discovered that every living thing has one of these little spirits in them. And if they harvest those harvest those spirits, they could use those to uh and just uh increase their lifespan and defeat death. So it's kind of a war between technology and nature, but then at the same time, the goddesses are mad that they're trying to play God themselves. And it, there's a lot going on. This is a multi-layered onion of a story. But and, and, and this is what, I mean, because you sent me this review copy. This is the PDF. I'm assuming that my hardcovers just were waiting for that in the mail. My, my oh, you haven't gotten them yet? No, not yet. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm just assuming. We're, we're, we're trying to schedule the truck to back up in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm I, I'm happy to get this PDF because it's the full thing. It's not just a preview PDF. It's really beautiful. I haven't read the entire story yet. Yeah. Because I'll be honest, Mike. I don't know. Let, let's get into let's get into it. Let, your books are beautiful here. Let's talk a little bit about comics and digital comics for a second. Let's talk to let's talk to Mike, the guy, the comics reader, the comics lover. I probably don't read as much as I should lately because I don't have as much mind share or time, but. Okay. Well, before we open it up to some questions, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, going to the viewer comments pretty soon. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about like digital comics. What's the magnetic strategy for digital comics, if you will. And, uh, and, and what do you think of them in general? Well, so for us, I mean, we've always released stuff digitally, but I mean, it's never been any kind of a, uh, it's never been any kind of a, a profit consideration. I mean, it's really the amount of money that comes from digital is just so negligible in the grand scheme of things. So we've always just kind of used it as just marketing, frankly. It's like, I mean, our books are, like you said, that, well, until you see them physically. I mean, we try to make just archival quality, just beautiful hardcovers that you want on your shelves, you know, curved corners, round backs, spot UV, like, you know, we want, we want to make customers who buy those books, the physical books. And if that means we need to entice them with, you know, teases of the story, you know, for a 99 cent single issue series uh, on Comixology, that's fine. I mean, we're not going to make a whole lot off of those 99 cents, but if yeah. it gives us a monthly excuse to put it back in front of eyeballs every 30 days on social media, um, that's kind of what it is. So for us, digital is, I mean, if it makes us money, that's great, but we never expect it to. For us, right. it's it's kind of a preview program that pays for itself. Well, I, I think there are some comics, I don't want to totally say digital comics are just garbage, mm -hmm. though they are. But, I, but no, there's some comics that lend themselves well to reading on comics. Like I can read sure. comic strips, black and white comic strips on a yeah. I, on a on a read or something that's pretty readable to me single page strips mm -hmm. even yep. some of the mr invincible stuff you had pretty readable to me in digital format yeah there's a couple of non-linear stories where that gets really hard to do on oh digital. with the pages yeah yeah there's one where there's like uh there's like a die cut out of a gate fold where it's like you pull it open and suddenly it's like he goes back in time and it, you can't do that digitally okay so, so i really do need to see okay I'm yeah. taking back all my great reviews of Mr. Invincible right now because I've only seen the inferior digital version. Like, so, I'm <laughs> so it's only going to be that much better. <laughs> yeah, right. No, if the, the, if the crappy digital one is this great, I'm going to love the printed <laughs> version. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, okay, let's talk about one more thing I forgot. We really had to tell uh, Lisa is going to kill us if we don't talk about uh, twenty Paris 2119, right? Because uh, yeah. well, give, yeah. give us the scoop on this. Well, so Paris 2119 is, uh, it's Magnetic's first kickstarted project. Actually, it's, I don't know, they, they, this probably just confuses things. It's actually, so it's being, the Kickstarter is being hosted by uh, Neurobellum, which is kind of my creative side uh, identity. Um, and Neurobellum has done six other Kickstarters that were all successful, but all of those products at the end of the day, well, they were published by Magnetic. So it's two, they are two separate entities. One of them is kind of like the project farm on crowdfunding and then Magnetic who actually puts it out on shelves. But this is the first time where, I mean, we are, Magnetic is definitely publishing this book in November, but what we're kickstarting is a exclusive variant cover by Peach Momoko, who's just really blowing up on the variant cover scene. And 
the campaign has done so well that we kept adding these stretch goals. Like we added, okay, we're going to throw in, you know, an Ashcan sketchbook blew past that goal. So it's like, all right, we're, uh, we're going to do a cool, like two inch metal uh, challenge coin with the cover art embossed on it. Blew past that goal. Um, we're creating uh, an original no soundtrack. I'm assuming this is like a preview copy or something. Oh I yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a pre-press. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful looking stuff, though. Really gorgeous looking stuff. I again, I haven't read it yet because I just I only got these copies yesterday, and I'm only human, Mike. I can't read oh, com even comics. I can't read them that. Um, That's fine. Yeah, no, this is I, a really it's a great book. We're calling it a cyberpunk love story or kind of a dystopic dark romance. It's, huh? I mean, it's a self-contained tale, but we've been describing it as like Black Mirror meets Blade Runner because it's very much kind of a a single self-contained, just noirish, cyber noirish tale of what happens when technology goes too far. Uh -huh. Yeah, this PDF has all kinds of notes all over it. So don't worry, there won't be those red boxes and stuff. But yeah, just the artwork alone is just fantastic. Dominique Bertail, the artist on this book, he also did a series that we published called Ghost Money which is also really, really cool, kind of near-future political intrigue and espionage. Um, but they did this book intentionally to be like a kind of a classic French sci-fi throwback. I mean, they, they intentionally wanted to kind of evoke feelings of like Bilal and Mobius and, and uh -huh. Mizzou. So, I mean, there's, there's an intentional line weights and kind of panel layout and even some of the aesthetic design choices of like cars and buildings. I mean, they're this this is this is an homage to that classic retro. Oh, yeah. yeah, come on, yeah. Right? Yeah, like exactly. this, this is yeah. great stuff. Yeah, the man. anti garage hat. Yeah. Totally, exactly. We love this. I, I haven't read it yet, but I mean I'm just I'm really looking forward to this one for, again for sure. And I could just frankly I could just look at it. And get a lot out of it because this is some really um, beautifully rendered stuff, but it's really good cartooning too. You can just tell that the, it flows the way somebody who has, you know, real comic storytelling chops. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the books that we put out have had recognized fans in the States, but they'll email us and say, yeah, I got this book like five years ago, you know, in a, at Stewarding Bookstore, but I never knew what the story was. So thanks for putting it out so I can actually read it. Oh, because they only had it in French or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So we've made a lot of people happy just by explaining what they've had on their shelf all this time. Mike, you, you made me happy here. Now let's make, let's make some other people's dreams come true. And let's go. I'm going to turn on your ability to see the comments, which you might not even look at because I'll just comb through them a little bit mm -hmm. and, uh, and see if there's anything interesting. I'm going to start up at the top. Oh. <laughs> Lisa Waiwu is in has been in the house talking to people in the comments the whole time. Um uh let's see. Oh, here's some some links here from Lisa. That's great. Um, oh, he carries our books. Uh when he mentioned Tel Aviv, that's a great interview. Oh, I think they're talking about um oh, yeah. uh Oh, oh, wow. I missed a bunch. Oh, holy cow. No, I'm sorry. There's tons and tons of chats up here that I missed. I walked way too far. Anyway, been enjoying many of your books, says Jay Sloan. Awesome. Heroinberg, longtime watcher of the show. Just came over from chat with Gary Cohen. Now look forward to Mike. Archaea published The Dark Crystal. Were you involved with that? Yep. Uh, I was publisher when it came out. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wasn't I, like editor or creative director or anything on the book. I was the thing about it, Archaea, is that's when I learned how to do all the all the math and scheduling. So I was a spreadsheet and schedule guy. But it was really, it was a just a, a crash course in all of the aspects of hardcore publishing. And it's right. oh, oh, and Lisa Wu says, uh, "We'll help you check out Magnetic Press's website and get to know us better." Doing something special at San Diego Comic Con at home. Tell us a little bit about. SDC at C at home. Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly how it's supposed to work. I mean, I, they haven't even, as far as I know, they haven't even really announced it, but it's supposed to go live tomorrow morning and people can go there and they can browse through the virtual floor show map and they can click on a booth and it'll bring a pop-up of what they have for sale and maybe show videos. But 
if you go to ours, I'm just telling you, if it looks anything like when we put it together, it's kind of boring and vanilla. So we made our own landing page. So when you go to the San Diego at home sites, it will take you to our landing page and our landing page has videos and uh, pictures and, you know, all kinds of colorful stuff to, you know, dazzle you with. And I mean, we're, we're offering all kinds of exclusives, some special prints and posters and signed book plates. And so we do have a bunch of exclusives for the show. Okay. Also, I don't know how you're going to replicate the real Comic-Con experience unless you can pack in like 100 people in with you while you're clicking on the computer. and Which sure is, they... I think, exactly what they were trying to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Um, okay, so I'm a fan of, oh, man, I'm going to try it. I'm a fan of Ah uh, Suerve and La Eternata stuff, although I don't understand a single word. Haha, great art. Yeah, so, we didn't good. publish any of those items but yeah i mean as foreign titles those are those are good books all right oh, oh new and established creators from around the world sharing the world the name so talk about how you find your creators and and i look we look at your stuff and i instantly people go euro comic they go well first they go heavy metal magazine oh right. this is what would have been published in heavy metal this is european comics but tell me really what's your uh geographically where where, where do your creators hail from all all over the place. I mean, we've, we've published stuff from, you know, guys in Brazil, Argentina, China, uh, Korea. Uh, I mean, a lot of them are from France and Belgium and Italy, a lot more from Italy these days. Italy has some really solid talent. Um, but yeah, it's just wherever we find them. I mean, a lot of what I pick up does come from my trips to Angoulême, but because I've been doing this now, I guess for almost 10 years, I've started to kind of build relationships with these other foreign publishers so they know what Magnetic can do. And so they'll share stuff yeah, right. oftentimes before it's even finished or published. So, I mean, a, a lot of times we'll actually have the scoop on things when they're still in the development stage. So, awesome. and I think they recognize that Magnetic's kind of carved out an aesthetic style. I mean, what we put out is not from a single French publisher, we kind of cherry pick from wherever we find stuff that fits our brand, so yeah. to speak. I mean, it's hard to explain what that brand aesthetic is, but I think people who followed us can kind of pick up on it without being able to put their finger on it. There's just something where it's it's kind of animated, it's kind of dynamic, it's kind of it's kind of Western, but not yeah. American, and so. I yeah, there's just something high quality but unique about it. I mean, okay, so I did, say magnetic comics are attractive comics. Oh, magnet, uh huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Magnetic? all right. That and one's the free, stories, right? and the stories will stick with you. Oh, I love it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> those are those are I first. I love Jasmine and need more. Is that a is that one? Of you, is that one of your guys too? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. Yeah, yeah, we did the first two volumes of Jazz Maynard right now. We're waiting for them to finish up enough for our third volume. It takes them a, at least a year to put together the equivalent of like three single issues. So mm -hmm. we kind of need them to finish up at least three of their band Désiné to make up one of our volumes. So yeah, so Jazz Maynard, we're just we're still in touch with the authors. We're just kind of waiting for them to get a little more in the can. So this can't be true. Super fan Lisa Wu says Magnetic has earned a total of 19 Eisner Award nominations in their first five of five years of eligibility. How, how, how many did you take home? None. None yet. yet. Yeah. Hey, but I always say it's more of an honor to be nominated because that's selected by judges. After that, it's a popularity contest. I think that's true. And the fact that, you know, we're having to reintroduce ourselves to so many people. Magnetic is not the popular kid in the room. We do some good stuff. Sure, I'm not going to, you know, brush off those comments, but we're not popular. We're, we're humble about it, I guess. That humility is not winning us trophies. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, hey, Fanographics is my favorite publisher. Looking forward to exploring Magnetic titles. Yeah. Are you yeah, a fan of what kind of yeah. comics you like reading, Mike? When you're, you know, when you're not publishing them, what it, what, what's coming out these days that, that's on your radar? You know, so I, man, whenever I've got time to read, I'm usually reading French books to see if I want to publish them or not. But when I am reading stuff that's on the shelves, I, 
I admit, I like a lot of image stuff. I mean, I'm still a huge fan of David Lapham and Straight Toasters. I like mm. the stuff Daniel Warren Johnson is doing, you know, Extremity and all that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I do lean more towards, I'd say, image style American comics. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, let me see here. We have, uh, we have we got a lot of Lisa stuff. I'm going to skip over some of the little Lisa <laughs> comment. Um, She's awesome and- at her job. She is super good. Lisa Wu is always working for clients for sure. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, yes. Enrico yes. Morricone just died recently. Yep. Look for our Morricone tribute in our last stream in the closing credits, Heroin Burn. Yeah. Speaking of tributes, actually, one thing that I've been trying to, I've, I've started trying to get some conversations going as I know. So Juan Jimenez, which is, he was just an amazing Spanish artist. Did a lot of stuff with humanoids um you know he passed away from covid i want to say it was march or april he was one of those oh my gosh um, yeah and he has such a huge following especially throughout europe and spain so i'm really hoping that i'm we might be able to get some kind of tribute book <laughs> for him. so humanoids so i just imagine like you at angulam you're at one of the festivals and uh, you see Mark Wade across the room and you're like, you're giving him side eye. Cause you guys are both like going to, you, you want I the same seen, people. I haven't seen him at Angoulême. I mean, I'm not saying he hasn't been there, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't Cause know. I mean, yeah. you know, humanoids is, I mean, they're a huge publisher in Europe already. I mean, the American right. side is just the North American branch, but um, a lot of our, like the Topi books, we license those from mosquito through humanoids humanoids actually acts as a literary agency for other publishers in europe oh i never knew that yeah oh that's yeah, so, really interesting. yeah okay. so a couple of titles we've actually actually we've licensed books to humanoids as well we did a book called daomu uh, a couple years ago it was kind of a chinese ghost story and we licensed that to humanoids for french publication Excellent. Love yeah. Sergio. Oh, Jay Sloan loves Sergio's artwork. Truly amazing. As a comic book illustrator is trying to improve in inking, these Topi books are so inspirational and fun to study. Yeah. I was just looking at, we just, we, I got a couple of advanced copies of volume four uh, that should be, should be in our warehouse and in stores, I think in late September, but I was flipping through it. And the thing that I like really looking at our editions is, you could tell that he was drawing the, I mean, th- these are all, this is, this is way pre-digital. So like in our reproductions, you can still see the pencil line underneath the ink. And in some cases when he's doing heavy ink washes, you can still see the pencil underneath the wash. And it's just, it's just really interesting to just see and kind of theorize his, his layering technique and like, you know, yeah, what right. went down first. Yeah. Um, are your books in at Kamikaze in Tel Aviv? Owner Ori is super nice. I don't know. I don't remember the name of the store. Maybe Lisa remembers, but yeah, I do remember that there was they were posted. They posted on Facebook, so I do remember. And this is probably a dumb question, but are you? I, 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 uh, you're a fluent French reader. As long as fluent doesn't mean fast. <laughs> like, I don't. I, I can I comb know. through. I can comb through reading something super slow, especially if I've got a dictionary or Google for reference uh, for the words I don't know. But as far as like speaking, I'm, I am so not fluent. I can go over there and I can survive a cab ride in a restaurant, you know, evening. But I'm not going to be holding any kind of political debates in French. Okay, Mike. Here we go. Here's one of those gotcha questions that Lisa warned me about. Let's see. Uh, yeah, but the original comics cost uh, what is this? Two euro, two two and a half euros. Some of us want to read the comics, not have a bunch of already looking hardbacks on the shelf that are twenty bucks each. Man, what do you got to say about that? Anything? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, I guess softcover versions available. You know, we've actually experimented this year with a couple. Like we've done, we did a soft cover version of Claw Volume Three. Just because we th- we also thought that the soft cover versions might keep the price point down for the for the younger audience. Like we also have a book called Milo's World. We did the third volume in soft cover, and in, well, we did both. So we did a co print of soft cover and hard cover, where we printed more of the soft cover because that's going to be the main edition. But we had the limited edition hard cover variant, 
And believe it or not, in both cases, we seem to be selling more of the hardcovers. So even doing things at a lower price point paperback, people are still gravitating towards the slightly uh -huh. higher price point hardcovers. Yeah, interesting. It might be it might be the small difference in price between the two. People go, ah, oh, for an extra five bucks or whatever it is, I want the I'll take the hardcover. That's kind of what it is. I mean, when you when we when we break down our production costs, like the difference between going from paperback to hardcover is so minimal that it's really uh, like a five dollar difference on the retail side, and it's. I mean, the perceived value difference is almost double. Okay. So last guy wanted cheaper comics. This guy's like, hey, man, what about some large, those giant artist edition size? Well, you got any of those in the works? Topi, the artist edition? Well, the Topi books are also 9 by 12. Right now, 9 by 12 is kind of the biggest book we've done. We've done we've done a couple 12 by 12s, like album-sized art books. But oh, okay. 12, inches, 12 inches seems to be kind of the limit that retailers can stand. Like, I think if we've done it, actually, I think we did one book that was a, just slightly over 12 inches. And a lot of retailers are like, ah, it, it just won't fit on the shelf. Like that extra half inch, like 12 inches seems to be what retailers can stand. Which Dude, is I, I, we won't do it. But. I hated it. I, there's nothing worse. You've got the shelf, right? You got the perfect spot for it. It's like it's gonna go right in with the other hard the other in this genre that you're book and it just won't fit. Yeah. So now it's gotta go on the oversized shelf or wherever that wherever there's just the stuff that doesn't fit goes. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's the reason why I mean actually the thing about band days and A is that that A4 size is just that is yeah. just too big for an American shelf. So yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many people have actually figured it out, but basically we scale everything down to 11. So whether that's seven and a half by 11, eight by 11, but we bring it down to 11 and it yeah. doesn't really compromise the artwork that much. Yeah, right. Right. See, Mike, you're using your noodle on that. I love it. That's why, that's why they bring in big brain Kennedy. Yeah. Math and spreadsheets. Uh, Lisa says mentioned uh, Pistuvi. Oh yeah. So Pistuvi is, um, so that's our newest announcement actually for the con. You know, we don't have a whole lot of title announcements, but Pistuvi, I think, is our big one. So it's written by this guy, Merwan, and it's illustrated by this guy, Bertrand Gatignol. And Bertrand did, we have a series of books called the Ogre God series, and they're very, they just look like beautiful black and white Disney animated feature quality comics, but they're just dark. They're just, it's like a dark story about man eating giants and stuff. So, um, but Pistuvi is drawn by the same guy, but it's it's about this, and it's for a middle grade audience. It's about a little girl who lives out in the woods in a tree house with this tiny little cartoon fox who gets into all kinds of trouble, but the whole world is kind of surreal, and like the world around them is it's caretaken by this giant kind of cyborgy tractor man who's constantly plowing down the trees and he's chased by the spirit of the wind who he loves. It's all very metaphorical. The whole book is a metaphor about growing up and having to abandon childhood into uh -huh. maturity. So it has, it has kind of a French gut punch emotional ending. Yeah. But even with that ending, it's still a super fun ride. I mean, it's just What's a beautiful book. book. It's called Pistuvi. Okay, that's what yeah. she's wanting. Yeah, and so we're just right. announcing it here at the show. But that'll be on shelves in November. And the cool thing is, is that will be our first book from this author, Merwan. And he's 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 getting to be a, a bigger and bigger deal in France these days. And we've got a book of his that we're going to be releasing in January that's just unbelievably amazing. And I, I guess I'm going to Spoil it now. We're going to be kickstarting that next, but it's a really, really amazing book. So, Merwan, when we were talking about bringing authors and artists over and introducing them kind of for the first time to an American audience, yeah, right. Merwan is he's the next guy on on, on my radar. Right. His his writing is fantastic. Okay, speaking of new people, hey Dan, mm -hmm. is there a submission process for new, unknown, or first time creators? Does Magnetic do that? Is there like do you, how yeah, does that work? We don't currently, just because so far, at least for this first year or so of our getting kind of reestablished and getting our feet underneath us, we're just sticking with the licensed stuff. I mean, right now our slate is full through 
fall of 2021. Um, so we're not currently accepting or looking at submissions, but that's not to say, you know, eventually I'd love Magnetic to get to that point where we're starting to develop new projects and, you know, it's not just licensed for creating things too. So right. Is that the writer in me wants to start creating? Well, that's what I was going to say, Mike, isn't that the next step? Isn't that the way, like, that's kind of the established pattern. When I look at all the even semi-successful indie companies, it's like licensed, make some money on some licenses, get some exposure with licenses, create your own stuff, get your own IP, license that out, rinse yep. and repeat. Yeah, and I think uh, I think polarity is behind that strategy because I mean one of their biggest focuses now that they got Lion Forge and Oni together so that Oni can really kind of take care of all that. Uh, polarity is really putting a lot of their focus on their animation department, Lion Forge Animation. I mean they oh. got that Eisner or not Eisner, they got the Oscar Award for Best Animated Short this year, so uh -huh. they're you know they're trying to ride that momentum into bigger and bigger animation right. projects. So they are very much interested in seeing what IP Magnetic can create. I'll bet. I'll bet. Well, yeah. you could keep your Oscars. We'll keep take our Eisners any day, right? Like, you come know, on. That's it'd just be nice to. I mean, the thing is, like, as I mean, okay, so the judge, you know, getting the nomination, that's the real honor, but that's not to say getting a little peer acknowledgement wouldn't be nice too. <laughs> Right. Well, man, well, I don't know. I'm not your peer. I'm not in the industry. I'm not a publisher or whatever, but I know good comments when I see it. And, yeah. and, and I'm really impressed by what you're putting out, Mike. A uh, couple last comments here. Hardcover is the way to go. Just very positive comment. I'm just, I love, that's rare on the internet and YouTube. So let's, let's savor <laughs> that. Yep. Um, here's another positive one. Let's, we're going to go out on this one. This is going to be our last one. Magnetic Press is quite impressive. Would love to have Mike on Mainframe Comic Con sometimes. The upcoming one is already booked, but I'll definitely reach out before we start another one. Cool. Who should you reach out to? Of course, you should reach out to the talented Lisa Wu. Yeah. She's, the, she's the PR press agent to the stars of the comic book world. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And we are sponsoring Mainframe. So, that's going to be, that'll, that'll be fun. I'm, I'm well, Mike, Lisa's, Lisa's getting us caught up on I'm not sure entirely what mainframe will encompass, but yeah, she's putting all that together. So killer, killer, fantastic. Okay, well, Mike, any last things you, you want to say before we and I, I know you gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here myself pretty soon. No, I mean I guess the big thing right now is I mean the, the Paris 2119 Kickstarter ends yeah. five o'clock on Thursday. So we've uh -huh. got I mean, we've unlocked the art book, we've unlocked the soundtrack, the collectible coin, the dash can. I mean, people are getting like fifty dollars worth of free stuff just for backing this campaign. So, if you have, yeah. if there are people out there interested in the book, back the campaign and get a bunch of free stuff. Okay, and I'm sure you've met your primary goals already and stuff for the campaign, and now yeah, it's those are these are all stretch goals. We, I mean, we just have we had to keep lining up new stretch goals because people kept knocking them down. I got it. Yeah, I got so it. So all that stuff is now free. So hopefully that'll bring in a lot of people in these last 48 hours. Well, well I hope you're ready for the comic book news bump, pal, because <laughs> woo, we got 16. I know we got 32 eyeballs watching us right now. 16 people. Nice. You know. <laughs> um, and, and one last question here. We'll close it out with this. Hey, question for me. How nervous do you get every time you open up live comments? A little bit nervous. Yeah. <laughs> there's been some stuff in there in the past that's been not great but man I, i'll say it again we've got one of the best the, the people that do show up to watch stuff like this they're people that really care about comics mike i can tell you're one of those people too oh um, yeah so thank you for coming thank you for watching I, I hope we can have you back sometime anytime you want to promote anything from magnetic yeah. you got you, yep you, you yeah got and you can you can expect a, a care package of lots of hard covers Woo, love it Man, that's so fantastic. Mike, stick around for a second and we'll talk. If you've, if you've got a few minutes, if you got a split, go ahead and, and we'll catch up later. But um, sure. I'm going to get out of here and, and we'll talk soon. Okay. okay, everybody. Hey, man, that was Mike Kenny. What a cool cat. Uh, really good looking comics that, again, surprised me. I've just been out of the game. You know, I come up to where I live. I live in a rural place. We had two comic stores. Now we got one. They carry what they can. They're primarily a game store that carries a, a really decent selection of comics, but I don't get to see all the wide variety. I'm lucky if I get everything Marvel, DC, and maybe some Dark Horse has to put out there. I don't get to see the wide variety of stuff that's out there. Luckily, we got a pretty decent bookstore scene up here. 
And uh, so I hope to see a lot more comics in those bookstores. I am seeing them every day. I hope to open a new comic book store. You know, we've had our series comic book 2.0, comic shop 2.0, I should say, talking about what it means to open uh, a new comic book store in the 21st century, post COVID, whatever you want to call it. We're going to continue down that road. And next week, oh my gosh, holy cow, who have we got? We've got the Comic Book Shopping Network, okay? Jesse James, Aaron Halland, and Timmy Haig are going to come in here, and they're going to talk about how they've got a 24-hour comic book selling machine going on. You can go on there on Facebook right now, any time of day, anywhere in the world, and see somebody hand-selling comics digitally online. Some people go, well, this is kind of weird. I think it's one of the most interesting and innovative digital um, business models of the 21st century. Influencer-based digital video hand selling. I don't know. M may maybe I'm nuts, but I think there's real potential there. And I'm going to pick their brains and we're going to talk about it. And I hope you guys will come along and, and check us out. Thank you for watching. Hey, if you haven't already, please consider hitting subscribe down there subscribe to this channel hit the little bell you get new notifications when i drop new videos like this here one you could also hit the join button man oh man if you hit join well you're just going to see a, a a plethora a panoply if you will of options uh of ways to give me money on a regularly scheduled basis check it out you can get your name in the opening credits or in the closing credits, which I'm about to roll right now. Stick around. There's a little cameo at the end uh, if you care about those kind of things. Thank you for tuning in, caring about comics. And most of all, thanks for watching. Yo, what up, Butter Peak? Yo, you got me shy to speak. You the same dime piece that I saw last week on the dance floor. Yo, the way you glide, you make a club of thugs do the electric slide. Pretty and pink. Come here, let me buy you a drink. I'm a better sour artist, but us both in sync. My name is Bobby, and I don't usually dance that much. I play the wall. But girl, you got that magic touch that lure me in like a fly into the spider's web. Not these everyday hoes, sweating ghettos to left. I roll. I heard you got the good power, yo. It slipped to my grip for an hour or two. I don't think that horror films or horror comics contribute to juvenile delinquency. I think that they may encourage psychotics and homicidal and other dangerous types. But juvenile delinquency is, a, I think, a symptom of the illness of our age. It doesn't come from lack of playgrounds or bad comic books, but of a great longing for youth to have something to rebel you wouldn't say that children are imitative and that they tend to imitate what they see or read? If they were, they would have come from the bear pits and the Globe Theater and committed some rather extraordinary acts in the Elizabethan well, days, you know.